made a note ask spidey so <laughs> i'm now i'm now i'm sending you this clip and now i'm doing this i'm asking spidey what did you see Hey guys, so I had a conversation with Spidey from the Behavioral Arts earlier last week after he put out that collaboration video we did discussing some of Amber Heard's testimony when she was on the witness stand. After a little bit of begging, I finally agreed to go spend one more night back on the pavement so that I could get into the courthouse to watch closing arguments so that we could have a follow-up discussion. Almost forgot to mention, at the end of this video, you guys are going to get my assessment of where Johnny Depp and Amber Heard stood at the end of closing arguments as the case was submitted to jury for deliberation. So make sure you stick around to the end. Okay, let's go. But you can find whatever Mr. Waldman's done and you can find whatever Mr. Depp has done. And both of those are the same for purposes of evaluating the verdict form. They stand in each other's shoes. When you have an agent and that's what the jury instructions say, you can go with both. What did Mr. Waldman do? There was an article about the sexual violence that he had put from the April one that went into the trial. Amber's testimony, she was sitting near him in the trial. Adam Waldman threw that newspaper down in front of her de defiantly. All right, Rob, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. I really have a feeling you have some great insight on this one, but there's one thing I want to throw at you and it's about hands and fingers. And I said earlier when we were talking about um, ben Rottenborn, that this is confidence. Deepling is confident. Now, her hands are up here, and I want you to pay attention mm -hmm. to her fingers. When she's talking up here, we see the fingers are pretty out like this as she's gesturing like this. Now, this is called digital extension. When we're confident or comfortable, our fingers go outwards. Even on a table when we rest them and they move outwards, this is comfortable, it's confident. But I want you to notice something. While her hands are in her field of vision to where she could see them, she's got this going on. The moment that they drop to where she can no longer see them, most of the time, they curl inwards. The fingers curl inwards. And this is called digital flexion. When our fingers go inwards, you know, because stress is usually tighter, more closed, aggression is closed, fists. So when we're lacking confidence, we see those fingers come inwards. So when she's talking, Several times her hands drop out of her own view and they go inwards like this. It's very rare that they don't. Once her left hand is out here and it stays kind of flat, it's still in her peripherals, but whenever they drop to a certain degree, they go inwards. And it's crazy how consistent that is. It's like over here, she's trying to show his confidence, but the moment it's out of sight, the fingers are going inwards. God damn it, Spidey. <laughs> like... Like I had, like I, I had something to say, um, but now it's like it's like I'm thinking of Elaine bringing her hand down and doing the fist, which is what she does like six times, right? Like I'm trying not to remember because I have to try to remember what I was supposed to say here. Uh, <laughs> God, all right, okay, okay. So now that I now have that piece of information, let me try to think about the irrelevant thing I was going to say about what she was doing. Oh, that's right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Anyways, so, so, so Ben Rottenborn, um, I think I mentioned this earlier when he's walking back and forth and when he has his hands like down below, I made the comment that you don't want to have your hands up high. Well, Elaine gives us the reason why you don't want to do that. Um, so many people have commented after Elaine had given her closing and said that she's all over the place. She's scatterbrained. And the thing is, is that this is what I was talking about. When you have your hands up here, you are literally creating three points of visual for a jury. And then you start to move two of those points of visual. And now you've got the jury looking at a circus and trying to figure out what to look at. And she's doing this the whole time and moving back and forth. When you have your hands low, you can do that movement because they're not really looking at the hands. They're looking at your face and they're, they're catching the movement in the peripheral. But when your hands are up here like this, you're distracting the jury. And Elaine does that terribly here. Like she really does get those hands really animated. Um, that plus the, uh, the whole like, closed fist thing. Uh, yeah, this was a pretty solid clip that I didn't think was going to be. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of cool because like it, 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 it's one of those cases where people will look at it and they'll be like, something feels off about this, but they're not sure why. And that, by the way, what you just said is absolutely brilliant. 
There's a difference between having these confident gestures here at the waist level as we gesture like this. This is confident, it's comfortable, and doing it up here. This doesn't really sit right. It's, it's too high up. And then take that and add it to the fact that the moment she can't see those hands, <laughs> you see that confidence come in a little. Like, and whew. yeah, and, it, and it, just, it just all comes together. It makes perfect sense. God, okay. Yeah, okay, let's go. <laughs> but they testified that they went through them. Dr. Hughes testified that she also spoke with Bonnie Jacobs. She kept contemporaneous notes from 2011 when she first started seeing Amber. And the abuse is documented in those notes is what Dr. Hughes testified to. They start in 2012, both physical and Ob Objection, Your Honor. That Dr. Hughes Admit testified to. Throughout this trial, it was just a parade of objection, 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 to a point where at some point, Elaine just got used to it. Every time an objection would come, she was just like, okay, well, can we, can we approach? Or she would just sort of, and every now and then she got a little irritated, but it became part of the pattern. In this particular objection, there was a little bit more feistiness from her. Like she turned around aggressively, like, and, and she kind of huffed as she moved towards the bench. So to me, one of two things is happening. Either she knew that she wasn't supposed to do this. And it's kind of like, oh, I really wish I got away with this. Or two, she was building up this stride and she was happy with it. And this is her moment. And earlier you said like, this is an actress, you know, on a stage and that stride was broken and she's aggravated by that. Rob, am I completely off? What do you feel? Do you feel like I'm somewhere in the right range with this? What, do you, what are you thinking here? I mean, you're pretty on point. Here's the thing that I kind of want everyone to understand is that a trial, as far as objections are concerned, objections during opening statements and closing arguments are very rarely made. If we go back to that theater diagram that I kind of laid out for everybody, you've got the opening statement, then you've got the evidence, you've got the closing argument. The evidence is when objections are made. That's when evidence is being presented and the person says, I object for some evidentiary reason that says it shouldn't be heard by the jury. Closing statements are when the, the attorney gets the ability to argue the evidence that's already in there to the jury. It says that someone testified that this was green. Therefore, this is green, Mr. Jury. Um, in this particular case, Elaine kind of takes that a little too far. Uh, and she actually starts to argue secondhand knowledge as if it were primary knowledge. And that you start to see Camille Vasquez get a little animated and she starts leaning forward, leaning forward, leaning forward. And even though decorum generally says you shouldn't object during closing, because a lot of this is leeway and argument, Camille is getting more and more frustrated. You see it in her body language. She reaches over and grabs Ben Chu, like to the point where you need to object to this now. And it's boom, objection. And then you see Elaine fireworks. Now, the cool thing about this one is that juror number seven, he is my favorite attention juror this guy has the attention span that i would have if i drank all the coffee in the whole wide world and took all of the other things that would make me have attention i wish i had this man's cup of coffee in the morning because he is staring at everything and processing everything real time he loves drama um and he loves watching elaine and ben chu fight at council table <laughs> so the second objection happens you can honestly see a little smirk come across his face as he watches them walk up to the bench. It doesn't mean anything for purposes of determining what side he is on. It just gives you a little bit of insight to the jury. And sometimes they are really curious about the legal process and watching some of these fights play out. Wow. Okay. So this is our, like he, he, he's drawn to the drama. Like he's here for the, he's already thinking about the, the book rights that he's going to shop for and the, and the TV series that he's going to write. I mean, I think he's, he's, he's also there for the intellectual, just the back and forth between these two tigers in a cage. Yeah, that's crazy. So was he, would you say that he was the only one that sort of perked up and took notice when this objection happened? Or what were the other ones doing? No, they all, they all take notice when objections happen. And it's weird. There's like a, depends on what's being spoken to. In this instance, um, all of the jurors were staring at the sidebar. For them... When you object during an argument like this, one of the reasons why they tell attorneys not attorneys not to object is because it draws attention to what was just being said. Mm -hmm. So 
when the objection happens, you watch all faces of the jury look to the bench and the jury is looking and they're trying to process what they had just heard in their head. They're saying something was being testified to about the notes and they're looking at the animated faces of the bench and they're trying to draw conclusions or inferences based on what they heard, what the argument is, and then what the next question that comes after that is. So they're really perked up or trying to trying to figure out what it was that they were they were supposed to hear but were not able to hear because of the objection and she went through and took the notes took photos took you know, she took everything she had calendars everything put it all together and you heard about at least 64 pages of detailed accountability of that and mr depp's team has been able to not refute any of that I remember they tried to impeach her and say well you didn't say that she said yes i did on page 64 Remember that? It was a very, very difficult process for her because there was an awful lot of it, and she put it in great detail. All right, so Spidey, I chose this clip for you because uh, I was in the gallery, and from the gallery, I don't really have a view of the parties from that perspective of a facial expression. And when you said, Rob, pick some clips, I'm flipping through this, and I catch myself looking at this, and I'm going, oh, my word, I did not see that. And I said, made a note ask spidey so <laughs> i'm now i'm now i'm sending you this clip and now i'm doing this i'm asking spidey what did you see yeah um that's a special little moment so first of all this entire trial people have been talking about that face from amber that she keeps doing and i want to take some time to talk about it so if we compare that to what sadness is supposed to look like so the most comprehensive research on universal emotions is by dr paul ekman who identified the universal emotions, the emotions that every human feels the exact same way. And of course, there's small nuances and differences, and we may not do all the things at the same time, but there's certain ways sadness is experienced across the board. One of them is we do see this downwards sort of bend to the mouth. And this is why we make like smiley faces with the mouth going this way, and everybody understands that that's sadness everywhere in the world. But Amber doesn't understand why. It's not the muscles of the mouth that make us go like this. With sadness, Paul Ekman discovered that a lot of the muscles of the face droop. They relax. And as a result, it pulls the corners of the mouth down. It's not a forced movement. But when Amber is trying to sell sadness, she purposely does this. She flexes the muscle here and pulls the corners down like this. Look how sad I am. But it looks wrong. Even to people intuitively, it looks wrong because that's not the reason the mouth usually does that. Now, the eyebrows, she's getting better at. There were times in the trial where it went more to anger or confusion. She wasn't doing it right. But in that moment, we're seeing the inner corners go up, and it's forming the line here that we call the grief muscle. It's usually a line with a bit of a dip. And she's actually doing that part pretty well. There's a few other things that are inconsistent, though. First of all, the speed at which the emotion is displayed on her face. It's too fast. Typically, and again, there's no absolutes. There's no you know ways it's 100% supposed to be done. But typically, it's a slower build. Something makes you emotional, and we slowly build that emotion. For her, here's what happened. We saw her look at the jury. Then we see her look for a quick second right at the camera. Then back to the jury. Then she puts this face on. There's two other things that don't make a whole lot of sense to me personally. The first is, throughout this entire closing arguments, there have been much more emotional moments than this. The lawyers have talked about real altercations, real moments of abuse. Elaine's not really talking about much in this moment to make her that emotional. So I miss, I'm not really sure why it's happening, you know, in terms of the story that's being told. And the second massive thing that I want to talk about here is this. As we evolved, we learned as a reflex to hide our vulnerabilities. This is why most of the time when we're talking and all of a sudden we get sad, for most of us, we look down. We hide the sadness because we know in the way that we evolved that if you show sadness, you show weakness, you show vulnerability. So typically, you know, think about it. You're talking, an emotion hits you and we're in the middle of a speech. You might often see people just sort of look down as they collect their thoughts and then try to come up and do it again. As a reflex, we do this. When she puts on her sad face, she puts it on display. We see the chin go up. 
as she goes like this. Now here she did that for a bit, then she went back down. But originally she did that thing that Amber Heard does where she goes upwards with it. She's displaying the sadness. So to me, because of the mouth, because of how fast it's seen on the face, it, and most importantly, how it's on display, this isn't an emotion. This is a performance. Rob, what do you think? It's the dramatic emotion and then the dramatic drop. And it's the, it's the theater of it. And you know what's funny about it is you go from that scene of Amber Heard making that big emotional peacock and then drop drama, cut scene, flip over to Elaine, Camille Vasquez in the background of the gallery behind them, and none of them have any expression that matches what you just saw in Amber's face. The dichotomy there and the contrast is so stark that it's kind of shocking to the viewer. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great point. Like she's the only one emoting in that moment. And look, can it be that a thought entered her head that made her sad? It's possible. Does it look different than sadness looks most of the time? Yes. But is it possible that something in that moment is actually making her sad? Yeah, it can be. Again, we're just pointing out things that are inconsistent with the way this would normally or typically look. So let's, let's come back at 2.10. Um, and just for the record, you, uh, plaintiffs have 39 minutes left for rebuttal. Defendants have six minutes. Okay? You, I didn't take any time off from the sidebars. Zero off from the sidebars. It's all from testimony. Okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Rob, I'm going to be honest with you. There are clips that you selected from the video that you sent to me, and I was like, ooh, can't wait to talk about that. I know exactly what I'm going to say. I've got nothing on this one. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to talk about. I feel like this is all about the proceedings and the law stuff, which is not my field at all, but I can't wait to hear what you have to tell us about that moment. What happened? Yeah, this one's kind of fun. Um, so Judge Ascarati gave both parties two hours for closing arguments, two hours to allocate as they saw fit. Now, the way the proceedings were set up was there was closing by Johnny Depp, closing by Amber Heard, rebuttal by Johnny Depp, sir rebuttal by Amber Heard. That's how it was allocated. Now, the parties can determine how much time they want to dedicate to each portion of that event. So um, the way that I predicted it was that Johnny Depp would, would allocate an hour and a half to their closing, that Amber Heard would de dedicate an hour and a half to their closing, and they would both have a half hour left over to go and rebut points that were made previously. This is really interesting because um, you guys remember back with uh, Elaine's Theater? the craziness and the discombobulated nature of the clothes. She ran long. She ran very long. So judge Ascarati announced here that Johnny Depp's side has 39 minutes left. And Amber Heard's side has six minutes left. Now you remember my original time estimates, 30 minutes that they would want dedicated to rebuttal six minutes is a death blow. And what happened was when Judge Ascarati announces this, that entire two tables of attorneys, the movement um, in a courtroom, attorneys are generally very slow. They're very methodical. They don't want to give away any sense of frustration or impression in that particular moment. Or moment, they looked like uh, 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 bees around a beehive. Just <laughs> there was a vibration to them. Um, the frustration just emanated from that entire table, and everyone in the gallery, myself, Mr. Runkle, uh, anyone else, was going, "How is this possible? What are they going to do? They have six minutes left. How is that going to happen?" Honestly, it was probably one of the most heated parts of the entire day was that allocation of time. Even besides. Elaine, the rest of the team didn't realize that they had very little time left? No one was tracking the time. And even prior to this, leading up to the very end of Elaine's closing argument, Judge Ascarati is looking uh, from her bench to the well where Elaine is arguing. And you can see her looking to her side and looking back at Elaine, looking to her side, looking back to Elaine. And when Elaine sits down and she finishes, she looks over to her law clerk and her law clerk holds up and says, and she nods and the law clerk walks over and gives her the note. And the note says 30, 39 and six minutes. And she reads it out. And it, 
I don't mean to say it was a death blow, but it was a really bad strategic failure on their part. Like you had to have someone watching that clock and it was terrible. And you know what, what's crazy about this too, is that this judge almost has a sacred relationship with time. Like she is so good with time, like throughout the entire trial, like she ended on time every day. You know, those, those lunch breaks were like, really like she, she, she was, you know, they would ask her like, can we go to lunch? No, I feel like, like she was very good at timekeeping. So I feel like to her, even here being questioned about time, I'm not sure she cared for that enormously. Cause she's like, no, no, I know what I'm doing. I'm good at this keeping time thing. So maybe this might provide insight to that analysis. She was Marine Corps. That makes so much sense. The, the, the timing and discipline that the military teaches, that makes so much sense. I didn't know. I promise you I didn't know. But that, that, that makes an enormous amount of sense. Yep. Wow. Of course I agree with that. But the First Amendment doesn't protect lies that hurt and defame people. And there's a difference. Ms. Hurd has no right to tell the world that Mr. Depp physically or sexually assaulted her when that isn't true. That's not protected speech. Our U.S. Constitution doesn't protect that speech. Okay, we're seeing a bit of a different Camille Vasquez there. She is spitting fire. The cadence is different. She's grounded. And there's just, the, the, you know, earlier she was stumbling a little, checking her notes, trying to take things again. But here it's like, bam, bam, bam. So I have a feeling something was happening in that jury box, Rob. I, I have a feeling that, that this new Camille Vasquez was sensed in the room. T tell us what was going on. Yeah, so this is rebuttal. And in rebuttal, you essentially are addressing the statements that were made by the counsel prior to you. So Mr. Rottenborn and Elaine, you saw Mr. Rottenborn come up and give this remarkable theater. And you remember the whole statement that he made about the, uh, the looking into the window of America's favorite pirate. Okay, well, now this is Camille Vasquez's chance to speak on behalf of her client in opposition to that and to rebut that. And the emotion that you feel in these words, um, play it back again, guys. You know, hit that little rewind button, play it back again. I've seen lawyers practice in courtrooms years and years, over a decade of attorneys trying cases. This is real. When she is making that statement, there is real emotion and strain behind that voice. She believes the words that she's saying. And the funny thing about that one, not funny thing about that one, I think the important part about that one is that when an attorney believes the words they're saying, it is impossible for the jury to not feel that. I am saying that it just, it is a truth. It is a factual statement. I don't care what anyone else says when the attorney believes the words that are coming out of their mouth that has impact and camille vasquez delivered that in a hammer strike and that was her rebuttal wow and and that was felt like did you notice that the jury was connecting with that they were locked on every juror was eyes on whether they agreed with it or not Camille Vasquez did her client the absolute favor of giving it everything she had and the juries respected, appreciated, and were attentive to it. So Rob, at the end of the day, if we talk about just general mood, I'm not talking about specific body language, but general mood when Johnny's team is talking and when Amber's team is talking, do you have an overall feeling of who the jury is connecting with more or is it pretty much the same all over the board? So what's funny is I have two different impressions of this trial. One is when I was watching the evidence. During the evidence, the jury could not connect with Lane Bredehoff. It was impossible. The questions were being objected to left, right, and center. She couldn't formulate a question to get the, get the right answer. And her witnesses always went sideways. And instead of trying to get them back on track, she fought them. And that alienates a jury. And you saw that from the jury. Contrary to Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez, who were great at, a, at getting language and information out of their witnesses. So during the evidentiary portion of this trial, I would say that you've got no question that Johnny Depp's attorneys were more attractive to the jury as giving them information they wanted to hear. That script changed dramatically at closing. 
where you had Camille Vasquez deliver a very impactful closing argument. And then you had Ben Rottenborn, who I've had this conversation with Ian Runkle. Um, Amber Heard's team, if Elaine had just stayed in her chair, you had Ben Rottenborn giving that delivery and you would have had that theater. I, I thought I thought you saw the two best attorneys in the courtroom that day, Camille Vasquez and Ben Rottenborn. And you know what's funny? The jury saw that too. They saw two equal competitors and they viewed them the same and they both had their engagement. It was honestly a wonderful thing to see from an attorney's perspective. So, yeah. I want to thank you so much for your time. Once again, this was such valuable information because, you know, lawyers can look at this footage and have opinions. Behavior analysts can look at this footage and have opinions. But having someone who understands both those things at the degree that you do, both law and behavior analysis and body language, actually being in the room, I don't think there's more valuable commentary to be had on this entire trial. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, Rob. And uh, I guess we're going to see this week how this whole thing uh, concludes. Thank you very much, buddy. And thank you for the very big compliment. I, I very much appreciate the work that you do. And I love watching everything you put out, buddy. Um, guys, this, this guy puts out great content and has insanely good analysis. And yeah, I guess we'll find out later this week uh, when the jury comes back with a verdict. So until then, we'll see you later. Excited. See you, everyone. So there it is, guys. I hope you enjoyed our take on closing arguments. I expect we'll have a verdict at some point in time this week, so we'll finally know how this Johnny Depp Amber Heard saga comes to a close. If you enjoyed this video, please remember the second part, or part one, however you want to call it, is over on Spidey's channel, The Behavioral Arts, so make sure you go check that out as well. Spidey puts out some great content and analysis of everything from Will Smith's slap heard around the world to testimony given in open court, so I put his channel in the can't miss category. One last thing. Before I let you go, I know that some of you are going to have some comments or questions on my take of how the parties ended up after closing arguments. If you wouldn't mind, go ahead and leave those questions in the comments below. And if you have a specific question, body language related, for Spidey, related to closing arguments, if you drop a pin with a timestamp from the trial testimony, maybe we can get enough comments and questions to have Spidey come on over to help do a follow-up video. Thanks, guys. Hope you have a good one. See you later.